Amen. Such a privilege to be worshiping with you this morning. Uh, we've been worshiping all week as we've gone on a journey uh, by God's grace to the nation of Israel, uh, not just in space, but also in time, 3,300 years ago. And those of you that have been uh, with us through the last two days, uh, it's, been, it's been encouraging, hasn't it, uh, to look at the book of Ruth and uh, just thinking about all the themes of redemption that we even sang this morning, our gratitude towards the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is seen in this book as we look at Boaz, who pictures the greater Boaz, who is Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for us and redeemed us from sin and made us his bride. And today we get to look at a Jewish wedding. Are you excited? Uh, a, a wedding ceremony. I, I, I didn't have uh, all the paraphernalia and all that, but we're going to have to use our imagination. And everyone loves a good wedding, don't they? Uh, I remember uh, still very vividly uh, when I first saw uh, Nicole, my bride, in her gown. And in fact, we had a little bit of a private meeting right before the wedding. And, and of course, the family had hidden her away from me. I didn't know what they were doing as they were decking her up. And the first time just seeing her, it was just, you know, my, my jaw just dropped down to the floor. And uh, we just, uh, you know, hugged and prayed and, and then got ready for the wedding. And it was just uh, those memories, those sweet memories implanted in my heart forever. And I'm sure some of you have those same memories as well, or you're looking forward to them. And every time I do a wedding, even in Goa, Goa has become a little bit of a wedding destination. So I've gotten to do some for my church members and even for others that have been visiting. It, it always is so moving, especially Christian marriage, to see the power of God's love, because as we were talking about yesterday and in uh, the sessions, every Christian marriage should just point us back to the greater marriage that we are a part of as the bride of Jesus Christ and He being our husband to show us that great power of eternal marriage and eternal redemption that we rest in forever and ever. All Christian marriage is temporary. But Christ's marriage to us is eternal. And I wanted to sort of remind you, even before we get into Ruth chapter 4, that it's not just Ephesians 5. We love Ephesians 5, and we read that at a lot of weddings, right? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid down his life. And, and that becomes a, a vivid picture of the backdrop of Jesus and his redemptive love in his marriage to the church. But really, this picture of Jewish marriage uh, is an interesting study. Of course, you can see it in the Old Testament of God seeing even Israel as His bride. But in, in the New Testament, it becomes even more rich and more vivid as you look at the love that Jesus has for us, His church. And this should just amaze you. Just, this should just cause you so much comfort. And that's really the goal, I think, of what we see here, even in Ruth chapter 4, that Jesus doesn't just look at us as prodigal sons and daughters and just give us a small little side room in His house, but He makes us His very bride, a precious possession in His sight. That is amazing redemption, isn't it? That is the picture that God uses of salvation for you and me. And Jewish marriage, as I was researching it, has basically four different stages. And this is so interesting to connect to even the New Testament that picks up on this picture of our relationship to our Lord Jesus Christ, our husband. So the first stage is betrothal, right? The engagement. Unfortunately, today, Engagement, is, it's, it's fun, it's precious, but in the Jewish mindset, you remember Joseph and Mary, when you're engaged, it's as good as marriage, except for you aren't together in the same house yet. And what happens when you get engaged? I remember when I was the, in the U.S., I don't know what, what it's like in Australia, but they say, you got to buy a big, fat ring, right, for your, your uh, fiancé and show her that you are committed to her. And, and the kind of guideline that they gave us there uh, because I was there at that time, was you got to spend at least three months of your salary and buy her something that shows that you are committed to this girl. And so I, I did that. But the Lord Jesus Christ does even more for us. He, um, for 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, he is engaged to us. Do you, do you know that that is the picture that we are in right now? 
Paul says this as he speaks about the church. He recognizes the church is not my church. The church doesn't belong to any pastor or to any apostle. The church is Jesus Christ's church. And he says in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband. Look at the language that he uses, even as a pastor, so that to Christ I may present to you, I may present you as a pure virgin. And that was Paul's uh, thinking that came from that Jewish mindset. And you remember the engagement ring that Jesus has given us, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14? It's, it's an, an investment that we can never have imagined. He gives us the Holy Spirit as our Arabon, as our engagement ring, to, to remind us day by day that He is committed to us. And so that's the stage that we are in right now. That's stage one. We are engaged to Christ. Now, what's happening during the engagement? Sometimes in Jewish engagements, uh, there's about a year, there's um, at least maybe six months, and you, ha- you go into the second stage, and it's called the stage of interval. The interval is where the husband is supposed to go and build a house and prepare a house where he can have his bride live in a refuge and a comfort that can take care of her in a very real and practical way. You remember the words of Jesus to his disciples and even to us in John chapter 14? This is just amazing. He's going to the cross. He's going to lay down his life for us. And yet, instead of thinking about his trial and his struggles, he thinks about his disciples who are, of course, confused and perplexed, just like you and me. And he reminds them. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. John chapter 14. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I personally, as your husband, in this stage of interval, am preparing a place for you. I love what uh, Keith Green said. I don't know how theologically accurate he is, but he made this statement that just always makes me chuckle. He said, if it took Jesus six days to create this world, and he's been preparing this place for 2,000 years... I mean, this world is a garbage can compared to the new Jerusalem (laughs) that Jesus has prepared for us. And that is his love for us. You know, the the whole concept of Jewish marriage should just enthrall your hearts as you think about it being used in that greater way for your relationship to your Savior. So we have the betrothal, the first stage. We've been engaged to Christ. We have the interval where he is preparing a place for his bride. His love just never ends for you and me. And then we have the possession. The possession is where the bridegroom goes with his friends to collect the bride from her house. And they usually go with a shofar trumpet. And uh, you usually have the the best man, the friend of the bridegroom, will go out and, and blow that thing outside the house so that she knows that she has to come out. And she, of course, gladly comes out and bum, 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 you know, and uh, we should probably try stuff like that today, baby, huh? frighten the socks off our in-laws. But isn't this the picture that is used even in the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? See, these are no accidents. These pictures are found throughout the Scripture that when Jesus comes, the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet will sound. I don't know what kind of shofar that's going to be, but it's going to be a loud shofar that's going to wake up the whole church all over the world and say, the bridegroom is here for his bride, and we will meet him in the air. And that's the possession. That's the possession where he will take us to be with him forever and ever, and we will even be delivered from the tribulation and the wrath that is to come because he loves us. And then finally, the fourth stage. You know, some of us have this misconception, and I have this misconception that we're already at the wedding and we're already married, but do you know that there is more to come? We're engaged right now, but the wedding feast is to come. That's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's, that's where we are going to be enjoying this banquet that Jesus has prepared for us, and it's going to start in Revelation 19, but it's going to go on forever and ever in heaven where we're going to be rejoicing at the banquet table of Jesus Christ. 
And so I hope you don't think that the best is, is here now. The best is to come in eternity forever and ever where Jesus will treat us as his precious bride forever and ever and wipe away every tear from our eyes. What a great resolution that is going to be to our lives, isn't it? Doesn't that give you just a sense of hope? I don't know what you're going through today, and I know that various ones of us are facing various trials, but to know that your life is not just controlled by circumstances, but your life is controlled by your husband, Jesus Christ. That is the hope that we have as Christians. And what does is, what is John remind us of in 1 John 3, verse 3? He says, everyone who has this hope of the marriage supper of the Lamb as a bride purifies himself. We're getting ready for that great marriage that is to take place. And so I want to remind you of that even before we get into Boaz, that Jesus is the ultimate husband for his church. And Boaz becomes, in a sense, like any Christian marriage, a picture of just the sacrifices that even ultimately Jesus makes for us in order for us to be his bride. So this morning, I want to encourage you. You know, sometimes there are some passages where we can talk about things we can do, and that's okay. But really, I think most of our sermons need to be speaking about what Jesus has done for us. It's frustrating to just have sermons sometimes that say, do this and do that, when you don't understand that all our doing is motivated by His doing. We can't love until we understand how much He has first loved us. And I think sometimes that's the engine that's missing in Christian faith, isn't it? That we would, we would deepen our understanding of the affections of Jesus Christ for His own people. And so may the Lord use this passage today maybe to, to remind you again of the, the, the love that Jesus has for you, even as we look at it dimly illustrated through Boaz. And Boaz becomes this kinsman redeemer, this goel for his bride Ruth in a illustration, I would say, of the ultimate husband, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has become like his people in everything so that he may redeem them, he may purify them, and he may make us his bride forever and ever. We could just close in prayer right now, right? <laughs> Say hallelujah. But it would be great if Jesus comes right now and takes us and ends my sermon. But let's, let's, Lord willing, go through this passage and see this picture of redemptive love even in Boaz. There's three blessings of redemption that are illustrated in Boaz in this passage. And we're going to look at them as we go through this text. The first one is Boaz as a, as a redeemer is the one who is a leader. He captures the moment in verses 1 and 2. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. I think like Naomi had said in the previous chapter, in the previous verse, he was probably thinking of the strategies of what he should do. He was praying. He was working through the ways in which he would work through this even very complicated situation with all the legal uh, caveats, and he was ready now. We don't know what he's going to do, but he comes as a man with a mission to rescue his bride. And he goes up to the gate. Now, why does he go to the gate? The gates of the cities in ancient times were usually in the low-lying areas, and they were not like our gates, you know, just these little piddly uh, iron gates or whatever. They were massive structures that archaeological digs have even shown is almost like a whole house with meeting rooms in there and thick walls, uh, 30 to 40 feet wide with lookout towers, different rooms. It was like a conference center, really. That's what a gate was like. It was there not only to protect the city, but also to be a place. They didn't have newspapers in those days, right? So the way in which you would find out the buzz of what was happening and the legal matters was you would go to the gates and people would be talking about gates, what's happening in town. And so Boaz goes to the gate to make this a very public event. He doesn't want to hide what he's doing with Ruth, but he wants to make this a very public event of his commitment to Ruth. And I love the way in which the goel, 
just happens. Again, you can see the sovereignty and the faithfulness of God throughout this text. The moment that Boaz gets there, the Lord had already woken up that Goel that was his major legal opponent and brought him there as well. And you can see the hand of God in, in this whole story from beginning to end, just like he is involved in our lives, right? He's a God who is not far from us, but he is a God who is with us. And so behold, you know, the text is almost chuckling. Behold, the, the Goel of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said to him, turn here, friend, and sit down. This is the same phrase that was used in chapter 1 for Elimelech, O oh, certain one, O oh, nameless one. You know, and you're, you're never going to know this guy's name. And you can see, I, I think Samuel, who wrote this book, had this device where he said, if I don't want to honor a man, I'm not going to use his name in my book. And so we have a certain guy, just this guy. We don't know who he is. He's not important. And he said, sit down here. And so the man turned aside and sat down. But not only did Boaz had the influence to make this man sit down, you know, you don't sit down unless you are told to sit down by somebody with authority, right? Most of us won't sit down unless the person that is asking us to sit down has some command over our lives. You can see that there was this sense of maybe physical presence, but even more spiritual strength. You look even at the next verse. He took 10 men of the elders. These were the leading men of the city. And he said to them, sit down here. And so at these gates, sometimes archaeological digs have even shown that in the meeting rooms, they would build in the plaster little benches that were made out of plaster where they could have councils and committees and so on to decide legal things. And so Boaz speaks to 10 elders and just says, sit down, and they say, yes, sir. You know, I mean, he has that kind of presence and spirituality that people listen to him. You can even begin to see why God has chosen a man like this to be a husband to Ruth. <laughs> he leads by his righteousness. He leads by his godliness. And that is the first thing that Boaz does to even capture this whole occasion. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3 says, Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And it will enable you to find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Ultimately, doesn't Jesus lead us with his righteousness, with his integrity, with his perfect life? And this is why he becomes a resting place for us, even as our husband, isn't it? And you can find that to be the strength, ultimately, that Boaz provides to this whole situation, that he's a man who leads in integrity, who leads in righteousness. But after he's got all these people here in this little council room and he's captured the moment and he's taken leadership over the moment and he's been a man, he then begins to deal with the problems. A leader first deals with the problems and, and provides solutions to the problems and counts the cost. You know, even Jesus, I don't like it sometimes when even in my own heart or people say, that, that our salvation was just free. It wasn't free. It was very costly, wasn't it? He gave his life for us. And I know, I know sometimes what we mean by that statement, but I think we, we need to not forget that, that for Jesus, it cost everything to, to win his bride. And so you can even see that sense of commitment and sacrifice that comes from Boaz that he wants to lay down his life and, and his resources to win this bride over. He counts the cost. In verse 3, he says to the Goel, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land. Now, there's a, a little bit of translation issue there which if you understand ancient Israeli property law, there is no way that Naomi as a widow could have even owned this piece of land. And I don't want to get into all the complexities. But I would say that the Hebrew can even be translated here, Naomi has to give this land. It's land that was under her family. It's even possible that when Elimelech left to Moab that he had mortgaged that land 
And so it was the duty of the goel to buy that land and buy them out of poverty. You see? And so in, in all of that, he would get the deal of owning a piece of land and getting some investment in his pocket. And so Boaz, being very wise, he's thought through this all, probably all night long. He starts not with Ruth, but he starts with the land. And he says, there's a piece of land. It's like, you know, a little bit of bait and switch. Are you interested in it? <laughs> Which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And so I thought to inform you, verse 4, saying, uh, would you buy it before the elders? And he's got all those witnesses there, those 10 elders. If you will redeem it, and he uses again that idea of redemption, of, of the, the root of being a goel, redeem it. But if not, you know, tell me because... I'm really interested. I want it too. And you can see the character of this nameless Goel, this one who shall not be named because of his lack of character being revealed as he says, sure, piece of land, I'll redeem it. I want to remind you again, yesterday in the notes, you, if you had a look at it, and you can review it again, the duty of a goel was limited to basically, if he wanted to, redeeming his relatives from poverty. It was not an obligation for a goel to marry any of his relatives, or to marry Ruth, or to marry a widow. That was a whole different case law that came from Deuteronomy 25, talking about a leveret marriage, and that was only an obligation to the actual brothers of a man who died, right? So if a man dies and he has a brother, and that brother is unmarried, then it is the duty of that brother, actual br blood brother, to pick up the widow, marry her so that she can have children. But catch this, is Boaz an actual brother to Elimelech? No. Is this Goel an actual brother to Elimelech? No. So the only obligation that a goel has is to maybe pay off their debts, buy their mortgage land. That's it. And this has been a, this has been a puzzle to commentators throughout as you're looking at, at this next verse because it's a very interesting verse where Boaz adds a twist. But I want to just say to you, it's a twist that nobody anticipated. If it was in the law of God that you had to marry Ruth, they would have all been anticipating it. But nobody anticipates it unless Boaz brings it up. So look at verse 5 again in that light. And this is what Boaz says. Then Boaz said, okay, O nameless one, on the day that you buy the field, here's a twist. Here's a little bit extra th that I wanted to add on to you that you hadn't thought about. He said, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. Now he connects something that is not normally connected, this whole Leverett law issue of marrying Ruth. And, and what's going on here? How can he say that you must marry Ruth? You know, something that we don't understand maybe sometimes in our culture is the whole principle of public shame that existed in Israeli culture. And when Boaz brings up this idea that Ruth is a destitute widow, and even my motivation in all of this is not just this piece of property, but it is her and the name of her family that needs to be raised again. That shame of even making that statement in public becomes an obligation that this man falls under. The graciousness of Boaz and the way in which he publicly states this as a need for grace for this woman becomes something that becomes a trap for this man. And he can't walk out of the situation and say, yeah, but the law says, you know, I just want to buy the land and I don't care about that woman now because Boaz has stated very clearly that she's a needy woman that needs grace. And he's created a situation of shame for this man that he doesn't want to walk into. Remember, it's very difficult, Jesus said, for a rich man. You could probably translate that. It's very difficult for a selfish man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I think that's probably the root of it, isn't it? 
And this Goel is not interested in Ruth. He's not interested in, in being involved in her life. He's just interested in getting land. And the moment he realizes that there's also some acts of mercy that need to be connected to that, he says, this deal isn't for me. I'm walking away. He gives up his rights to Boaz in verse 6. He says, I cannot redeem it for myself. That, that would jeopardize my, my own inheritance. Then I'd have to worry about kids and then sharing up. I want that land for me. I want to build a nice palatial mansion on it. I don't want to worry about kids and sharing with other people. You, you see his concerns? It's just selfish. Redeem it for yourself. You can have my right of redemption. I cannot redeem it. He's, he's a man that is typically guided by sometimes the the status of a lot of boys and single men in this world. They want to be safe, single, and satisfied, right? My life is just for myself and for my own means and for my own pleasure, and I don't want anyone else in it complicating things for me, right? Unfortunately, even today, some, some married couples, they don't want children in their lives because they're like, oh, we're so happy just enjoying our lives by ourselves, and there's that, that sense of greed and selfishness that has corrupted even the way in which we have relationships with one another. Sadly, you can see that in this man. He's a boy. He's not a man. What's the difference between boys and men? Boys think, think only about themselves. Men, especially gospel-centered men, they think about others. And you're not ready to get married unless you're a man. Amen? <laughs> and so this is, I think, the, the great contrast that rises up between this man and Boaz. Boaz is a man who is a Christ-like man. Wasn't Christ like this? I mean, when you think about it, Jesus is the one person who could have legitimately only lived for himself and not been idolatrous, right? Because he is God. And yet, what did he do? He showed us this greater love that is greater than any love that we can imagine. In John 15, verses 12 and 13, he reminded us of this. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And the word agape, love there, is sacrificial love. Greater love, and then he defines it, has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And that, in a, in a dim way, brothers and sisters, is the love that Boaz shows for Ruth. He counts the cost and lays down his life for Ruth, lays down his possessions for Ruth. Jesus is the greater husband who has laid down his life for us, his church. What a rest that is, isn't it? What a rest that is to know that Jesus has paid it all. We were singing that, that song earlier, and I can never get over the fact, Jesus, thank you, and then it, it defines, we were once your enemies, we, we deserve to be crushed under the force of the wrath of God because of the things that we did against Christ, but because He paid the cost of not just His physical life, but even laid down spiritually His life and absorbed all the wrath of God for you and me and cried out on that cross, what? Not it is started, but it is finished. Because of that, we can rest, right? Right? I live in, in Goa where the Catholic Church is, is muddied this so badly and they say you keep needing to run back to God and giving confession and it's not finished yet and you need to add something because your husband hasn't fully paid everything and it is such a frustrating life to live. But the true gospel gives you rest at night because you know that your husband has provided all that you need. And even death itself it's but sleep, right? We don't have to worry. Have I confessed my last sin? You know, oh no, if I haven't, I'm going to be spending all these, this, these years in limbo maybe somewhere. But he is paid even for, in one sense, our unconfessed sin. That's a great reality, isn't it? So that we can, we can even die and say, I know that as I die, I can be confident that I will see my husband on the other side. He has paid it all. 
Boaz counts the cost and reminds us of Christ. But in all this mercy, I think one of the things we can see is he also changes history as we look at the last part of this passage. Boaz changes history through redeeming love, both in the present and then even ultimately by the grace of God in Christ in eternity. History is changed because of what Boaz did on that day 3,300 years ago. In the present, how does Boaz change history? Verse 7, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another, and this was like signing a certificate and saying, okay, I give up my rights. Today we go to the lawyer and maybe make a sale deed or something like that, and in those days, it was a little simpler. You take your shoe off and you give it to the other guy and say, okay, the deed is done. You say, where did they get these ideas from? Well, actually, it was a, a kind of toned-down, septic version of what actually was written in the law in Leveret marriage. If a brother's wife shall come to the elders and say, you know, I don't want this woman, then what she shall do, actually, this is what the law said in Deuteronomy 25, 9, she shall pull his sandal off and spit in his face. Okay, uh, that's pretty devastating. I don't think anyone wants to experience that. So they had kind of toned it down and just said, okay, no spitting face, okay? Let's take that, that clause out. Just say, I'll give you my sandal, okay? I'll give you my sandal and we can walk away peacefully. And so they had, they had created this sort of toned down version to show that I'm giving up my rights to be a goel and somebody else can be a goel in my place. And so the closest relative, verse 8, said to Boaz, She's yours, the land is yours. He removed his sandal. And now we don't hear from this nameless one again. We look at the, the man who is the redeemer of Ruth. Then Boaz, verse 9, he makes two covenants. You know, <clears throat> marriage, even today, modern Christian marriage, I think very appropriately has vows. Why? Because marriage, Christian marriage starts with covenant first. So many people make this mistake of thinking that marriage is based on romance or marriage is based on sexuality. If you base your marriage on that, you have a very weak and even destructive foundation to your marriage. Our marriage to Christ is based on a commitment that he made to the Father before the foundation of the world, the promise that he made to die for his bride and redeem his bride. And so also, before we get into our marriage ceremonies, we have this idea of making commitments to one another. And you have that model here in Boaz, the covenant that he makes. He makes a covenant in verse 9 of saying to the elders and all the people, you are my witnesses today that I've brought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech, all that belong to Kilion and Machlon, and I will raise up their name. And I will make sure that these fallen men in their sin will now have children that will continue this line. Just, just think about this. This is an amazing thing. If Boaz, in God's providence, had not stepped to the plate, then David wouldn't have been born. Now, you know, probably these people in this generation didn't even know what was at stake. God did. But just his sacrifice and his faithfulness is not just something that impacts him and impacts Ruth, but it changes the course of Israeli history from this point that the line of David is preserved, which ultimately is what? The line of Jesus Christ. You can see God's faithfulness in that as well. But not only does he make a covenant of lifting up the name of this line of David, but he makes a covenant to care for Ruth in verse 10. He says, moreover, and this is really his concern, he says, I, I don't care for money. He was a rich man. He says, but I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess. Isn't this an amazing thing? Some people read the Old Testament and they say, I don't like the Old Testament. It's only about Israel. No, it isn't. The Old Testament has so many stories of Gentiles being absorbed into Israel because God is a God who cares for all the tribes and all the nations. Amen? I, I would encourage you even when you're reading the Exodus, when Israel was leaving Egypt, in Exodus, there's an interesting episode. It's in chapter uh, 12 and the end of chapter 12. You remember when they celebrate the Passover? God gives instructions to them immediately and saying, if there's any foreigner in your midst, then you need to go through this ceremony of circumcision so that they can become a part of your nation. 
And then it says towards the end that when Israel left Egypt, they left a mixed multitude. This is something that people don't realize. The ten plagues were an evangelistic message that God used to turn some Egyptians away from idolatry and make them part of the nation of Israel. And God has always had a heart for the Gentiles. He's always had a heart for the peoples of this world. And when Israel forgot that, they failed. But when Israel recognized that, they became exactly what God intended them to be. And this is what God does as he brings Ruth, not just to a place in Israel, but even to a place where she ultimately becomes the great, 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 I don't know how many greats you have to add, grandmother of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? A widow from a, a land that is cursed gets included into such a, a position of, of love in God's plan. That's what God does. This is the, the victorious triumph at the end of this book. And then the elders and the people testify, and they, they begin to just grow in praising God. Remember, this is the day of the judges where hardly anybody was worshiping God, and, and what Boaz does is he begins to, to generate a sense of seeing that God is God, and He is sovereign, and we need to live not in dependence on these false idols, but on Him who is living and active and can actually change our lives. Verse 11 all the people who were in the court said, we are witnesses. May Yahweh make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, the matriarchs of Israel. May that kind of time return to the nation of Israel. That time of experience of his faithfulness and blessing. May Boaz be blessed not just with, with wealth, but may he be blessed. I think the idea here, may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem, I think it's the idea of even a posterity of children, which is so much better than wealth, right? In India, most people say you've got to have only two children because of population explosion. So I get in trouble sometimes because I've had five. But I just want to have as many children as God allows us. Now we've stopped, okay, just in case you're wondering. Uh, so that we can, not so much, you know, just for the love which is precious, but we can influence the next generation for Jesus Christ. That's wealth that is better than money or possessions or anything else that you can have, amen? And so they pray this blessing upon Boaz. They say in verse 12, this is a very curious verse. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, to the offspring which Yahweh will give you by this young woman. What's going on here? I mean, some of you might know the story of Tamar, who actually was rejected by Onan, you remember, who should have supported her in Leveret marriage. And so then she responded with sin, and she got into an incestuous relationship with Judah, her father, and out of that was born the twin sons, Perez and and Zara, and you're saying, how in the world can they use that story and, and invoke a blessing on it? Well, it's because we have seen throughout Ruth that we have a God who is a God who is able to produce beauty in the midst of great ashes and sin, right? And these people are beginning to recognize that, that our sin is never greater than our Savior. And they said, just like God was able to take the tragedy and the sin and the weirdness of what happened in Tamar and produce the line of Perez, which is where we are here today, may he do something even greater through Ruth. They're going from the lesser to the greater. May, may what is happening through Ruth and Boaz produce even a greater line and a greater redemption so that people may sing the praises of God throughout all eternity. They're beginning to realize that we serve a God who controls history in his faithfulness. You know, this is good for us to realize sometimes because we think of God's faithfulness, you know, it's just in my little tiny life and, you know, my little tiny world and then suddenly the politicians change and we lose all hope and all anxiety and we forget that He's the God who is on His throne over all nations and all kings and all history and that's what they're beginning to realize and they're beginning to have encouragement and comfort as they see the greatness of God in this time. 
the people who know their God. I love this verse, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. Who begin to know their God as a great God will display strength and take action. What is the reason why we are weak sometimes is because we don't know our God. We don't know who He is. And these people are beginning to know God now as a great God, as a powerful God, as a great Savior who overcomes even the sin of His people. But not only does Boaz change history in the present, but he also changes history by God's grace in Christ and in eternity. You look at verse 13 and following, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her, and I love these words, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. Ruth had been barren all these years. Why? Because of the Lord's sovereignty. And Ruth has a child now. Why? It's not just because of human actions, it's because of the Lord's grace. And so we could even see, you know, Psalm 127, verse 3, Behold, children are a gift from the Lord. My wife and I had a worship service five times in the hospital because we just realized, God, we didn't do this. You did this. This nine months of you stitching and weaving and and creating these babies that are gifts from you. It's a gift from you. And so the people realized that. Verse 14, Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is Yahweh who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old, for your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons. What a great statement that is to make about a woman, right? <laughs> she is a, a woman who is better than seven strong strapping sons in the way in which she served God and through that what God did in her life. But I want you to catch, you know, some of the interesting things that they're saying here are just way beyond what you would normally say as a blessing over a child. They say, Blessed is Yahweh, verse 14, who has not left you without a redeemer. And as we're going to see later on, I think they're talking more about Obed than they're talking about Boaz now. And may he also, through this child, be to you a restorer of life. This child is going to actually be a way of bringing back life to you, power over death. What in the world is going on here? I think that these people, now remember, they had only about seven books, but they had a lot of messianic promises. What was the first time the Messiah was promised? The first time the gospel was preached? You remember when it was? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head. That's a fascinating verse. It's a verse of promise in the middle of the curse. You know, I think that's why Adam and Eve, they named their first son what? Cain, you know what Cain means, Cain? I have received, I have gotten. Big misunderstanding. They thought Cain was their Messiah. And then very quickly they realized he wasn't, you know, as they watched him grow. <laughs> and they named their second son. You know what they named their second son? Hevel. You know what Abel means? It's the word that is repeated over and over again in Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. What a sad name for a guy who was actually the more righteous son. <laughs> but they lost all hope. They said, we know our kids aren't Messiahs anymore. But the people kept reading that verse. You know, we think, you know, maybe only we understand that verse. I think this verse became a precious treasure to the people of Israel saying, we are waiting for a Messiah. We are waiting for a Messiah. And you know what? They began reading those promises again. And they said to Naomi, they said, you know what? We think that the Messiah is coming through you again. And life is going to be restored. And sin is going to be forgiven. And we're hoping in all those promises again that we would be back to that redemption that God gave us in the Garden of Eden. Now, they didn't know that ultimately it would be in Jesus, but they were hoping in Him. And so what did they call the son even? What did they call the son? Naomi becomes his nurse, by the way. I think that's just that she became his caregiver, his dry nurse. And the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. And so I remember when we were naming our kids, Man, that's the hardest thing. 
But this is such a helpful thing. The whole community came together and had a committee meeting on naming this guy. So it was like a communal decision. They said, this is not just your kid, okay? This is a kid that is going to affect the whole nation, and we all want to name him together. And so they named him Obed, which basically means servant. You know what the favorite name of the prophets, especially prophet Isaiah, is for Jesus? Servant. The one who can finally obey God because we've all failed and stand in our place. This is what these people were actually believing in at this moment. God was producing a sense of messianic hope in this people. They were beginning to see that Christ was going to be their shade and their redeemer. We have 66 books that we can trust in Christ. They had seven books and they were trusting in Christ. And therefore you have this genealogy at the end of Ruth that is reflected in Matthew, right? And we read the genealogy today, but I want to add that one verse that is added at the end of Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. After Judah, after Perez, after Boaz, after Jesse, after David, verse 16 of Matthew chapter 1, and to Jacob was born Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom was born Jesus, who is the ultimate servant that these people were hoping in, that we rest in. Matthew chapter 10, verse 45, for the Son of Man did not come to be served. Hallelujah, what a Savior we have. As the Puritans say, we can give Jesus nothing except for our sin. And He gave us everything. He did not come to be served, but to serve, to be that servant, to be that Obed that they were hoping in and give His life as a ransom for many. 1 Peter 1, 18. Know that you have a goel, that you were redeemed. Not with perishable things, like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. What a precious lesson this is, isn't it? Of Ruth. It's not just about Ruth. It's about God and his faithfulness to us, and his faithfulness, and all his promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Is Jesus your rest today? I don't want to assume, even this morning, that you know Jesus Christ. Just because you're in church doesn't make you a Christian. Like jumping in the ocean doesn't make you a fish. You have to know Christ, and only then can you have rest, a rest that will give you that same rest that was given to these people in this time. Christian, if you know Christ, would you cast your burdens upon Him because you can't bear them, but He can. Just as He did at Calvary, He can continue to bear your burdens, amen? But not just rest, but would you even run and say, because of this redemptive love, because you have loved me, Lord, I want to live in love towards you and towards others. Isn't that the way in which the love of Christ is manifested in our lives, that we would reveal His redemptive generosity in all our relationships with one another. And that's the way in which the world will see that we are His disciples when we have that love that He has bathed us with. Amen? May He come soon so that we may rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb, which is better than this marriage, is coming. Amen? May it come soon, and may his bride be ready. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the encouragement that we can get, even from Old Testament books that show us so clearly that you, Jesus, are not an afterthought, but you were planned and you, have, you were committed to redeem us even before eternity, even as you saw our rebellion, even as you saw our sin, even as you saw our destitution. Lord, you did not cringe from us, but you moved towards us. And you gave your life for us. And you continue to preserve us by your intercession. Lord, help us as your people to not think much of our love first before we think of your love. And to let that be the fuel of our lives, Lord. May your church, even this church, grow in knowing you, in knowing Christ, and do great things for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.